Tuesday, April 9th is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda, and we have a few tonight. Connie? Yes, thank you. I would like to start tonight by introducing some guests we have. We Actually, we have several guests here tonight in varying um, groups, but we're going to start with a group that is associated with the exchange visit between students and, and uh, staff from Archangel Russia. Um, a, who are visiting as part of a, um, a double uh, a trip both to this district and to Falmouth. There was a reception held a week ago Sunday. And we have Glenn Kirstein, who is one of the uh, Cape parents involved with arranging this. And we also have um, Carrie Curtis and his wife, Kathleen Kent, who are hosting family. And we have a Russian visitor. I will do my best to pronounce this well, Galina Polya. And if I could ask uh, Glenn to introduce Galina to us, I understand we're going to start the evening with a message from Russia. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, eight years ago, uh, the communities in the greater Portland area got together and formed the sister city relationship with our Congels, Russia. Um, that organization uh, that was created is called the Greater Portland Archangel um, Committee. It has been, in the last eight years, um, operating both adult and youth exchanges. Operates much the way municipal government does, even though it's a nonprofit. There is this large umbrella organization, um, and under it there are several different committees. Um, since 1988, every June, uh, approximately 14 Greater Portland um, adults have journeyed for uh, approximately 10 days to our sister city um, in northern Russia. Archangel is located um, on the White Sea, and I describe it as being about an inch to the right of Finland. <laughs> um, every October, between a dozen and two dozen Russian adults um, come to the Greater Portland region for an exchange. Um, there are also other cultural exchanges that occur between our two sister cities. Um, within, under that big umbrella is a committee called the Youth Exchange Committee that operates uh, not unlike a school department within a municipality. It is equal to all of the others combined. Um, for four years, I've been involved with the Youth Exchange. Um, both of my daughters have participated both as, as hosts and uh, my younger daughter journeyed to Archangel last year. Um, my wife and I got actively involved because it really is an unbelievable experience for the children um, and the adults. Um, I presently serve as the treasurer of that organization. And for the last six years, um, the, the primary focus of the youth exchange, though not the only one, um, has been a month-long simultaneous exchange between 12 students and two adults from historically two schools in Archangel and 12 students and two adults, typically teachers, um, from the 13 participating communities in the greater Portland area. By the way, Cape Elizabeth is one of the member communities. For the six years, there have been three schools who participated as host schools. Those were Gray New Gloucester, Portland, and Deering. This year, we made an effort to, to expand um, the schools on both sides of the ocean who participated. Um, historically, there had been two schools in our Congals, School 6 and School 21. This year, um, there are four schools that are participating. The two new ones are the Northern Economic Lyceum, and as the name implies, its, its focus is um, on business, and the City Lyceum. School 6 and School 21, the two schools who have participated all along, have, have had their focus in English language. 
This year, for the first time, we split the, the 12 incoming students into two schools, Falmouth and Cape Elizabeth. And Cape Elizabeth was gracious enough to, to host those, those six. It's been a wonderful experience. We are two weeks into the exchange, and we have two left. Um, the uh, Russian students have, on their arrival, spent two days in New York City and three days in Washington, DC. They came here thoroughly exhausted, and then we gave them a party. Um, and um, let's see, on Friday, they're going to, to visit Boston. Um, and on Thursday, they're going to be presenting in, in this chamber um, some democracy building case projects um, to show them a little bit about what goes on at, at the local governmental level. This evening, the, um, the teacher who has uh, chaperoned the six Russians in, in Cape Elizabeth is here to uh, thank you and I believe to present a gift. Her name, as, as Connie indicated, is uh, Galina Puglia, and she is a teacher at the Northern Economic Lyceum. Um, Galina, would you like to come to the podium? I'm a German teacher. It's very difficult for me to speak the English language, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And today, I want to say that the school administration and to all teachers, all students on, of this school, thank you very much for your reception, for your help. And I thank the Portland Committee for the opportunity to come to Portland. I want to say thank you very much to Mr. Donald Hutchings and his wife for their hard work. They made our trip from New York to Portland very interesting. They showed us two big cities, um, <clears throat> New York and Washington. And I hope we will continue our uh, educational exchange and because it's very important for our children, for our future. We are all from different countries and different cities, but the problem of peace is everybody concerned. And our future and our peace depend on our children. And um, in my town, in Archangel, in many families, we have um, the wood birds. Because these wood birds bring luck. And I said in Archangel too that very many wood birds are flowering in the sky area of Portland. But I didn't see these wood birds in the sky of Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> and today I want to present to, to you these wood birds and I want to wish you and all people of Cape, of Cape Elizabeth, good luck. Oh, thank you. If I might just add, just as the lighthouse is a symbol of our good town, the bird of happiness um, is the symbol of Archangel, and we have many of them flying in our house. And I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gail just suggested we uh, put it up here, so Gail, I'm going to let you open it while I go on. Thank you. We are very glad you are here, and I'm sure we are learning just as much about uh, your country as you are learning about ours here. Um, the next item on the agenda, oh, we're still on adjustments to the agenda, and there are a few others that um, under number seven, school board subcommittees and reports, we want to delete the policy subcommittee. They did not meet this month. We want to delete the health and guidance committee. They're not ready to report. We wanted to add the business, building committee, 
and we wanted to add the Arts Committee. Um, oh, look. Oh, isn't, it? That, oh, isn't that beautiful? Ooh. Ooh, oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Beautiful. That is really charming. Thank you. Yeah. Carla? I also could do a very brief research strand committee. Great. We will add the research strand committee. And I wanted to add um, Megan Barnes to number four comments by high school, middle school, and a Pond Cove student tonight. Are there any other adjustments? Did we explain what Megan is doing? I will. Uh, Megan has been um, principal for the day, which was an auction item, and she has been busy all day, and I'm sure we're going to hear about it. But today was her day to be principal of the day for Pond, at Pond Cove. Terrific. Great. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Um, the other thing I wanted to announce that is printed at the top of the agenda is that citizens in the audience are invited to speak on a topic that is introduced during the course of the meeting. Each citizen is, limited, is to be limited to one presentation per citizen per topic of not more than five minutes. Audience participation shall cease on a topic at such time as the chairman calls for the board action. And I would just ask you to raise your hand to be recognized at that time. But thanks. Um, the next item is approval of the March 12th school board minutes. I think we got a new set tonight. Is that right, Mary? Are there any adjustments? Seeing none, the minutes are accepted. And the next item is comments by high school and middle school and Pond Cove reps. We're going to start at the high school tonight, and we're going to work down so that Megan has a chance to hear other ones go. Um, on April 5th, our third quarter ended, so this Friday all high school students should be bringing home a report card. And we have also had all our course selection sheets returned, so probably within a week we should have um, a rough schedule for everyone. And um, the spring sports are underway, and this year we have a new sport, um, girls lacrosse. And I'm actually playing on that team, and it's so far it's been a great experience, and we've learned a lot. <laughs> um, fine Arts Night was a great success. The band played and the play Jack of the Submission was done and there was student artwork displayed, photography, and sculptures and paintings. And on May 4th, the prom is scheduled, Junior Senior Palm. It's gonna be held at the Marriott this year. And the elections for next year's SAC committee, the Student Advisory Council, is gonna be held when we get back from vacation. Great, are there any questions? Charlie? I would just like to comment on Fine Arts Night. It was an exceptional night from all three mediums that were presented and uh, is a testament to those who are um, teaching our children and our children's talents. It was fun. <laughs> it was wonderful. And as far as lacrosse, you're just in practice, right? You haven't played any games? Have you played any scrimmages? Um, no, we have. Um a uh, little mini tournament uh, next Saturday, and our first game is Tuesday after we get back from vacation. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Thank you. And do we have middle school reps tonight? Yep. Thank you. Um. Everyone at the middle school has been very busy this month, especially the seventh and eighth grade. Um, the eighth grade have just started a main unit where they went on trips like to our state capital and to Portland. And this week is also foreign language week. And the fifth and sixth graders have made foreign language bookmarks and the eighth graders have made foreign language stamps. And also like we heard previously, the Russian students have come in to talk to us. And um, last, week there was a talent show which went well and just this week we started our spring sports which includes softball, baseball, track and lacrosse. Um, upcoming freshman elections are coming up as well as the 7th and 8th grade dance April 26th which we hope goes better than our previous one. Um, the math teams and science fair activities have just ended and here's a summary of how their whole season went. 
Um, seventh and eighth grade teams traveled to three meets. The eighth grade team took fourth place at our first meet, second at our second meet, and second in our third meet. We were competing with, competing with 16 other schools in Southern Maine. And the seventh grade took first place at the first meet, fifth place in the second meet, and third place in our third meet. And our math counts team of Melissa Yashua, Katie Dana, Andrew Clough, and Max Sprague finished first in the statewide math counts meet in Augusta in strong competition against nine other schools from Presque Isle to Wayne Fleet. 58 students um, participated from across the state. And for the science fair that just took place in seventh grade, here are the results from that. 10 students were selected from the seventh grade science open house as possible representatives to the Triple C science fair held at Scarborough. Liza Williams took a third place award in the physical science category at the fair. And representing our school was Liza, Tim Butterworth, Kristen Nielsen, Matt Christian said, Kristen Barton, and Nick Betzold. And also about the younger grades, as um, the, sixth, the fifth and sixth grade challenge classes went to Augusta to see plays they'd been studying. And the sixth grade presented clocks to the fifth grade to teach them how to measure time. And also, tomorrow night and the night after, there's going to be a play put on by the drama club. And it's called The Knights of the Rad Table, I think. And you're welcome to come if you want. That's it. Thank, thank you. you. Any questions? No, thank you. And next, Megan Barnes from Pond Cove. Hi, my name is Megan Barnes. I'm a third grader at Pond Cove. I'm a principal for a day. I asked my parents to bid on this job at the Leap for Learning auction. During my day, I visited every classroom and answered questions from the kids. Every class asked for more recess, but I didn't think that was <laughs> such a good idea. Some kids also asked for no homework that night, but I only said yes to one class. <laughs> I also helped supervise the cafeteria. I met the middle school and high school principals and assistant principals and the directors of community services and tramp transportation. I also met a visiting magician, Len Solomon, who knows a lot about making musical instruments. I used the intercom to make a few announcements I read to a kindergarten class. My favorite part of the day was calling buses on the intercom and visiting classes. My hardest decision of the day was answering the homework and recess questions and the hat discussion. I would like to thank Mrs. Brown and Mrs. McLean for all their help. And a big thank you to Mr. Eismeyer for sharing his day and showing me what it's like to be principal. And I want to thank all the other students at Pond Cove for making my day special, especially my third grade class. Any questions? <laughs> Charlie. Which class didn't you give homework to? Um, Mrs. Swift, because they're the only class that, their whole class said that they didn't want homework, and other classes, only one kid said no homework. And so I just said yes to the class who all didn't want homework. I'm glad majority rules. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions for Megan? Huh? Did, did the kids want to be able to wear caps in school? Is that what? They yes, did? I said yes to a few second grade classes and um, a couple third grade classes. Are there other questions? Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> uh, the next item on the agenda is communications. Honey? I'm very glad to see that we have affirmative action alive and well, and that we have a, uh, a woman uh, principal for a day. <laughs> Good show. Communications, uh, some of these you had in your packet. I'll just go down through them, and then I have a couple of others to share with you. Uh, we received a, a communication from Joy Crenshaw, a student at the high school. She's planning on a trip abroad this summer for uh, to Latin America, as it explains here, Amigos is a not-for-profit organization. Um, I don't think she intended this as a uh, formal request to the school board. She simply wanted you to be aware of this project that she's involved with, and if you have any ideas about helping her out with her funding, I'm sure she'd be glad to hear from you. Um, we also, uh, in, during the past uh, few 
weeks have had a number of things come in recognizing staff. I might point out in in uh, Mr. Eismeyer's, Tom Eismeyer's packet on uh, Pond Cove, there was a letter to Debbie, uh, Deborah Jordan Pearson on uh, a project called Maine's Teacher of the Year program. Uh, I didn't have a similar letter, but I also know that Betsy Nielsen, um, our technology teacher, one of our technology teachers at the high school, was similarly honored. I did attend that um, reception. It's a very interesting process, something new this year, a former Teacher of the Year uh, the lady whose uh, name is on this letter that's in your packet, Dorothy Neal, felt that um, uh, although the regular Teacher of the Year program, uh, which is, is structured and people go through quite a, a long process, is uh, she herself benefited from it and she certainly supports it, but she felt there were so many teachers who deserved recognition that she wanted to try to start something a little different. What this is is that Shop and Save gave her and others working with her a grant um, I think it was during the number, the month of November, they had posters in Shop and Save and, and um, people shopping in the store were encouraged to fill out a form nominating a teacher uh, simply as somebody that they knew and admired and wanted to nominate as a teacher of the year. So this is not the um, more formal process, uh, but it brought in throughout the state hundreds of teachers who were honored in uh, area mostly by Cumberland, uh, by county receptions and the, the one that our two teachers, uh, Debbie Jordan Pearson and Betsy Nielsen were honored at uh, was Cumberland County. There were probably over a hundred teachers there, uh, family, uh, various other school people and I realized when I went too, worked in three diff different districts in the area, I saw all kinds of old friends because it really was kind of a heartwarming event. People who might not choose to go through the more formal and long drawn out process um, I think we're suitably honored, so was, that's, that's background on that particular one, and I also wanted to call your attention to the fact that Betsy Nielsen was part of that. In addition, we have um, a record, a, uh, an item here uh, from uh, uh, Judy Liberty mentioning that Jen Cannell was recently honored with a student recognition work for her superior work in foreign language. Congratulations, Jen. We also, of course, have a letter here from Mary Ellen Tracy, a former teacher, by the way, at Cape Elizabeth, uh, who was a president of the Foreign Language Association of Maine, indicating that Sue Dana, one of our teachers, of course, of, uh, at the uh, middle school, has been named as the Foreign Language Teacher of the Year. Uh, so another congratulations. And I included also a letter that uh, was sent to me, a copy of the letter sent originally to Rick, from um, uh, Mary Van Milligan, the librarian in Scarborough High School, as a result of a visit to our library. What particularly impressed her about the way that Joyce Bell, our high school librarian, has in fact created what she describes as being one of the very best in the state. So I thought I would share all of that with you, and congratulations to the teachers and to Jen Cannell. Uh, we're certainly proud of you. In addition, in communications, I wanted you to be aware uh, that we, we, some actually last year and again earlier this year, we mentioned that we had a teacher who was interested in applying for a Fulbright exchange program um, and that we have now heard or she has heard that the uh, possibility of having that exchange program uh, may go forward. That's uh, Paige Brown who teaches French at the middle school. Uh, I have met with Paige and with Nancy Hutton, the principal. The process actually required us to get started with filling out paperwork as soon as we were notified. Um, they have uh, found a teacher who uh, looks like an extremely good match for this particular program. However, it's still not a finished item, and I will keep you informed and be happy, and I'm sure Paige would be very happy to sit down and discuss with you. and. Um, Nancy and I some of the details. If all goes through, and this is only really some of the preliminary steps, what this will be is a teacher from <coughs> France would be uh, coming to the middle school teaching the French courses that Paige is teaching. Paige herself would be then in France teaching English courses because the teacher who, would, who is being suggested as a match is currently teaching English uh, in a situation about the same age level and so forth. So um, that is in the process of going forward, uh, but we still don't have a final 
answer on that. Um, and the last thing I had for communications, I just included in your packet for your information. We have an interim report on our science grant, and uh, I put that in so that you could see that where we were. And that's it. Thank you. Charlie? On March 21st, I attended the General Advisory Committee for Portland Arts and Technology High School. Um, we essentially were served lunch by the Culinary Arts Program and went through an agenda. One of those was um, member communities reporting back on their budget adoptions and all had reported back but one community, which wasn't present there to give their report, but everybody else had voted in favor. Um, there were a number of issues that were addressed and um, I have agreed to serve on a um, go here somewhere on a program development um, improve, school improvement team uh, which will be looking at um, potential program areas that they wish to, to explore and possibly develop, and they include electronics technology, telecommunications, computer repair, video technology, law enforcement technology, environmental technology, and also look at uh, some of the current programs for expansion, such as machine tool, expansion of the auto parts store, and expansion of their health occupation staffing. Um, they would be looking at funding and, and exploring grants, corporate partnerships, and reviewing current offerings. So I'm going to serve on that, mainly because I, some of those potential programs I see, some of the areas that we are developing, and also areas that I could see some of our student body um, showing some interest in. Thank you, Charlie. Any other communications, Keith? I just want to make note of, of our uh, junior high and high school our middle school and high school uh, band programs have been very busy lately. Uh, the high school band, and in addition to the Fine Arts Night, uh, the jazz ensemble recently attended the uh, jazz festival at Berkeley College down in Boston, and I guess they did very well down there. Uh, the high school band uh, performed in concert with Scarborough bands recently, and also uh, at a co concert band competition, I believe it was at, at Gorham. Uh, and the junior high band recently just performed at the state legislature with uh, raving reviews from, from our, our representatives up there. So my congratulations to the, the band programs. Thank you. Any other communications? The next item on the agenda is superintendent's report. Connie. Thank you. I'm going to start with a report. Actually, Lyle Kramer, the our chief testing honcho. <laughs> Way to describe. <laughs> Aidens Counselor at the middle school is here to run down through. You received in your packet not only his summary but also the data from the this year's eighth grade MEAs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. With your permission, what I'll do is kind of highlight the uh, important points in the report and then open it up to questions from you folks. Um, first of all, on page two of the report, that page two to the right gives you a breakdown of the number of students who were tested both across the state and here at Cape Elizabeth. You might note that all of our students took the tests and all of our students at the eighth grade level are included in the uh, testing results. The other thing that happens is that uh, some schools have said that Cape Elizabeth receives our great scores and our high scores because we don't test all of our handicapped students. If you look at the report, you'll notice that quite the contrary is true. 51% uh, of students with unidentified handicapping condition across the state were tested. So that while people across the state test only half of their special needs students, we test, this year at least, we tested all of our special needs students. To the left of that page two of the report, of the, uh, the state report, it gives a summary of the, uh, all of the tests for the past three years and a cumulative average at the bottom. This year in reading, we received a score of 375, and that's up from the past two years. 
in writing. We received a score of 345. That's a scale score that is down a little bit from last year. In mathematics, we've done real well for the last five years, receiving the top score of 400. In science, we received a score of 340 this year. That's down somewhat from the past two years. In social studies, we received a score of 335 compared to 350 of last year. In arts and humanities, we received a score of 330 compared to 335 last year. And in health, we received a score of, of uh, 335 up from 320 the prior year. Um, if you look at my report to uh, the uh, narrative from me, I have listed those scores towards the bottom of page one, and those have been added to the scores from the past 10 years, so you can get a perspective of how grade eight students have scored over the years. If you flip to page two, which should be an added page because when this report was copied, uh, page two stuck to the top page, so you had to have a supplement. I hope you have that. If you don't, I do have some extra copies of page two. Um, if you go to the second chart down, that compares the, uh, the uh, boys' scores to the girls' scores, both at Cape Elizabeth and for the state. In that chart, uh, the boys and girls at Cape Elizabeth are compared in the first two columns. And you'll see that in, well, before I go to the comparison, keep in mind that last year, the reporting of the MEA was changed so that the uh, scores were reported as uh, novice, basic, advanced, and, uh, and uh, let's see. What is distinguished is the top one. Um, so that when I talk about reading, math, and writing, we talk about, I list there, the percent of students who are advanced, who received an advanced rating or above. And then when you go to the science, the social studies, the humanities, and the health, they, have, they revert back to scaled scores. So that is why the first three scores tend to be double-digit numbers, and the last four scores are three-digit numbers. Um, for Cape Elizabeth, the girls, 20% of the girls scored higher than the uh, boys or at the advanced level or above. In writing, it was pretty even with the girls having 8% more. In math, 12% more of the boys scored at the advanced level or, abo or above. And then we switched to the scaled scores. And you can see that in science, the girls outscored the boys by 68 scale score points. In social studies, 16. In humanities, the girls were up by 51. And in health, the girls were up by eight. Now, if you go back to the top of the page, that is where I listed scores in science and social studies for the last three years. And I did that because when I reported last year, I pointed out the difference between uh, the uh, girls' improvement when the, score, when the tests moved from about half open-ended responses and half multiple choice questions. When that happened, the girls' scores, the boys' scores went down by over 50 scale score points, and the girls went up by over 50 points. And I pointed out to you that you have to wonder if if the difference or the gain made by the boys is attributed to the, the fact that they have to use those writing skills uh, where they uh, historically have been very much weaker than the girls. And uh, I think that that tends to point out how the format of a test, I think, and the way in which you have to present information oftentimes causes significant differences in the scores. And, and those scores are, are highly significant and a dramatic change as the, uh, the scores just changed tremendously as we went from one format to another. <laughs> um, the uh, chart at the bottom of, this, of the page shows how our kids with an identified handicap and condition scored. And, on, and the, the column to the right shows that our students 
outperformed other kids across the state, uh, across the state very significantly. And in many cases, many of our, the average of our special needs kids e come close to, or in some cases equal, the average scores for, for some subjects. The last page, page three, gives you a breakdown of how our students at grade eight scored compared to what that grade did four years ago in grade four. The reading was up by 65 points, writing was up by 65, math was up 30, science up 10, social studies up 35, and humanities decreased by 10. And I would point out, too, that uh, that, is, <clears throat> that is not a direct one on one exact group compared to another because about 25% of the students will turn over in those four years. So number one, the test is a different slightly different test, and you are testing a different group of students by about 75%, so, or 25%. So you should use caution in making those kinds of comparisons. I did, for your information, include a letter that is received by the parents of uh, students who take the test. Um, it, you might notice that uh, the percent of students in the different areas of reading, math, and writing, the, different, the percentage of different students who receive novice scores, basic, advanced, and distinguished vary a lot depending upon the subject area that you're looking at. I have a, uh, I've included a uh, definition of reporting categories, and then the very last page is a normal curve, which shows that uh, even though this a variation in our scores of, of uh, about 70 points from 330 to 400. All of that variation takes place within the top 5% of schools across the state. So even though a score may be 70 scale score points difference, different, because it's at the extreme of that normal curve equivalent, the actual placement of, this, of the Cape Elizabeth schools compared to other schools across the state does not vary by more than 5% from, from high to low. And that's between the 95th and 100th percent, or 99th percentile of schools across the state. So that's a real quick review. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to address those. Questions? Keith? Just curious if the state is comparing girls against boys also. Yes, they do. That's the other. If you, if you look at my chart on page two, you can see on the left, it's the, I've included the Cape Elizabeth comparison. Mm -hmm. If you look to the right where it says boys and girls, and in reading, for instance, the boys were 15, the girls 29, that is a state comparison, or comparison of kids for the state as a whole. Lyle, I have a comments. As you look at the performance levels in the reading results, uh, more than half of our kids are classified at the basic level, even though our score appears to be um, 375 and quite good. It still puts 73 children at the basic level and eight at the novice, the two lower categories. And the same um, kind of thing happens on um, well, the writing's a bit better, and it's interesting because our writing score is only 345, but we still then have most of our kids at the advanced or distinguished level. So it's hard sometimes to compare the numerical scores we get and then what we get for the advanced, distinguished, those kind of categories. Is there any explanation for that? You have to go back to some of the discussion that was made public and that Connie and I participated in with some people at the State Department level when this change was made. Um, when you're looking at the state comparisons, remember that you're comparing our students and their average scores to the average scores of students in other schools. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of debate focused on how did they arrive at what is a distinguished, uh, what's a distinguished Sample. definition, um, what is a uh, advanced, what's a basic, what's a novice. 
And if you remember, there was a lot of discussion about, especially at the fourth grade level, how college professors and, and teachers at seventh and eighth or high school level set the uh, definition for elementary school kids. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting. That's a, it's a, to me, it's a very vague yeah. well, the math, definition to get a grasp. The math score at 400 looks like we're real good in math, and then when you look at the performance levels, 87 students are at the basic level, um, which is the majority of the students are there, and the, we have six at the distinguished and 34 at the advanced, but you know, it is, it's, it is confusing with the levels. That's for sure. Well, part of that, part of that discussion is that um, not only was the, the test uh, changed as far as format so that it was all open-ended, but this whole issue of, of um, pulling out and comparison ranking in, in, that, in those ways, it's almost like adding a dimension that hadn't existed before anyway. Uh, we certainly are uh, talking about this because one of the things about the learning standards was, you know, high expectations for everybody, which, you know, at the state level that appears to be somewhat on hold, although I guess there'll be some, some activity on that this year. But uh, this district, for the six years I've been here, has been talking about higher expectations, and I think that's what you're talking about here. There's, a, there's sort of a, a continuum where you have what is the standard that should be held for everybody, what is a standard that maybe, and, and even that, as you can see, has some variations. Um, then there is the issue of a stretching. No matter where you may be, there is a, <laughs> there's a level that, uh, at least as we are now doing things, most kids don't reach. Uh, you could argue, of course, I suppose that's an 800 on an SAT score, but at the same time, that's going to be the argument of the future. People are definitely pushing for narrowing that gap. Uh, and all the discussions that I heard at the state level on learning results, there were people who were saying, well, not everybody can do that. Um, how do you provide? Where do you really cut off those standards? Those are not easy issues to, um, uh, to discuss. So expect to see more of that. But that's, that's an additional factor from what was in the MEA. The MEA itself uh, has been used more to talk about the overall success, school by school, relatively speaking, district by district. It's kind of a comparison basis, uh, and this is a new piece. Yeah, it's just interesting. I think you have to be careful how you look at the, the results. Other questions? Thank you, Lyle. I just wanted to say we did pass a school board policy that said we were going to report on test scores at the June and November meetings um, in the future. So it would be great if we could try to get on track for the next year. November. June and November, excuse me. Um, June and November are the two in the policy that was passed mm. the month before. Um, so I don't want to hear this report again. I'm just saying that in the future, we'll probably be hearing from you in June and November on those dates. Okay. Does that sound? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you. Very briefly, I don't have a written report on the staff development day, but uh, we do have a report in progress because we got uh, evaluation sheets from teachers. Just for you, just refresh everybody's memory, we did have a makeup. Actually, it was just making up a snow day. I don't want to use the S word right now, but. Um, <laughs> considering the possibility of snow tomorrow, I can't believe it. I don't want to think about it. Anyway, we had our staff development day um, last uh, Saturday, a week ago Saturday. And by all accounts, it seems to have gone very well. The staff were very uh, you know, good-natured about it. They were very engaged, um, mostly group by group, mostly system-wide. Um, uh, curriculum discussions, and we will have a summary uh, of reports from each of those groups. We just don't have it all now. We, we have uh, gone, Mary and I have gone through some of the uh, sheets responding, individual teacher evaluation sheets, and they were positive. I think it was, and certainly my conversations with uh, individual teachers, uh, it is something that people are hungry to do, and it's very much needed. So uh, when we look at the calendar for next year, um, I think you'll see there's an opportunity to continue that work. Um, 
should you choose to put two days together, and I hope that that will keep on going. Good start. Thanks. And finally, I did put in your packet uh, a summary you had asked to have a report back from a small group commission to actually take all the focus group data and try to uh, really crunch hard on whether or not we needed to rewrite the mission statement, uh, uh, throw it out, start all over again, et cetera. And our report in essence says, no, we don't throw it out. There's a lot of consensus that that is the direction that this community and school community want to go in, but we had some quarrels with specific wording. Obviously, I had a time crunch to get this report. If you look at the last uh, date of our meeting, um, the last meeting was um, April 2nd, which was only last week. I had to get this into the board packet. Um, your options are to take it as it is, which is somewhat unfinished, or to ask me to go back and finish it, and I'm willing to do that. <laughs> Um, but I did want to give you, uh, since I had promised to give you a report in April, I did want to get that far. And I also would like, um, because actually as far as to this point, this small group, uh, Charlie's the only board member who has been able to participate, and I think at this point the final crunching down, if that's what you want me to do, it would be good to have one or two board members involved in that because you're going to live with it. <laughs> um, I spoke to Connie earlier and I thought we should do that, and um, I was happy to help with that. And if other board members um, would be interested, Charlie would. would anybody know. else? Um, include anybody. And okay. We'll get the language. Some okay. Sort of draft. And I think that you can see the direction in which this came. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me was the um, looking at our mission statement. We didn't have the student in there. And now that we're into student results, it seems inappropriate not to explicitly mention students. It's one of the things that happens and why revisiting uh, mission statements is important. After all, in five or six years or five years, you can see a real growth of understanding that there are some issues that need to be um, focused on. And then we found the word academics was so confusing. That is the very definition of the word um, pointed out in a number of the discussions in the focus groups, um, it seemed to be more confusing than helpful. Uh, on the other hand, we also thought that the second sentence in our mission statement probably belongs somewhere else, that is, in a means to an end rather than it, it jars. When you really get into this, as we did in our secondary discussion, uh, it doesn't quite fit. Um, yet the idea was acceptable to most people, although many people said, well, if that's not really the way you're operating. Um, so it's that kind of discussion we were into for these three meetings that are summarized here. Uh, and I think we're hopefully getting to the end. And if you have any thoughts or comments, if you just want to write up on, uh, make notes on this paper and get it back to me, I'd be happy to get your feedback. I think that would be useful. And then I'll set a date and call people and see who's available and we'll get on with it. Okay. And did you have a, no. No, I just, I'd be happy to help. Okay. okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the next item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports, and we'll start with the finance subcommittee. Charlie. Uh, we met at 6.30 in the chamber conference room, reviewed the warrants and signed them, reviewed the appropriations and any outstanding um, overages. Um, we also listed uh, preliminary budget additions, which we will address later in our agenda. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, next item on the agenda is the superintendent search committee. Anne? Um, yes, the superintendent uh, search subcommittee <laughs> <laughs> met with uh, seven semifinalists. Um, and tonight, um, the board members from that committee will be presenting to the full board our recommendations for finalists. Um, at that meeting, we'll also be discussing, uh, you know, when, when we'll have uh, the finalists come back and the format of those visits and possible site visits to the finalist districts. Um, so we're kind of at an interim point here where we're, we're about to have a whole lot more information for the public, but until we've had this, this discussion, we won't be able to 
uh, tell you much more. Um, I would just like to thank um, the people who were on this subcommittee interviewing these candidates because everybody put in a great deal of effort. Um, Charlie, Beth, and, and I were the board members on, on the committee, um, the three building administrators, Tom Meismar, Nancy Hutton, and Rick DeFusco, um, two teachers, Gail Parker, Carrie Hall, and two community members, Mark Foray and Mike Roy. Thank you all very much for your uh, dedicated service. Um, so we'll have more, more information for the public shortly. Thank you, Anne. Um, Technology Committee did not meet, is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, Policy Subcommittee did not meet. Health Guidance is not reporting. Um, Building Committee we will do next. Charlie? Sounds Charlie, did you want to report? <laughs> oh, yes, as soon as I find my building committee. <laughs> <laughs> and I did bring it, okay. Uh, we met on, was it March 25th? I can't remember. I can't remember. That was April 1st. April 1st? April 3rd? Yeah, April 1st. First. The report, the report says March 25th, that's why. Uh, as a committee of the whole, and essentially reviewed some outstanding um, uh, change orders, those type of things, uh, reviewed some operational concerns, looked at some unfinished work, um, looked at some structural reviews and essentially did a project closeout summary and the closeout summary and recommendation was to, to create a subcommittee of Paul LaLiberty, Jeff White and Bob Howe to kind of um, um, supervise um, the closeout and the continuing um, change orders and those type of things that are still outstanding. Um, the total budget at this point Point is at $24,848.95. That's what's remaining. There are some change orders which will reduce that. Um, there is some money still being held from the general contractor until some of these issues, such as the punch list, are, are completed and they are substantial. So just to let the community know that we are aware of many things that you may see in the building as you uh, travel through it, and we are aware of those and are working on resolving those. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, can, can I just yes. add one thing? Um, I think this is probably a good opportunity to um, let the public know that the middle school baseball field will not be in use um, this spring. And um, just tonight on the way to this meeting, I asked someone very politely to get off that field because a lot of very expensive work was done to that infield. And right now, I don't think it's really um, adequately roped off. But that field is not going to be used by anybody. Um, it's going to be seeded shortly, I guess. And then we'll have to stay off it for quite some time. So I think we'd probably appreciate cooperation and staying off the field. I should have probably said that 60% of the meeting was focused on that particular issue right. because it was part of an unresolved um, contractual issue. And uh, it was an interesting meeting. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> but one way or the other, you either had it for this season or you, or you had it for next season. And to, um, to follow the, the contract, it would be better to the board that the committee finally decided it would be better to complete it through the contract and have a fully functioning field next spring. We might also want to mention that they will be moving the um, guard rail, the wooden fence a bit um, so that that will be a little further away from the foul line and there's some landscaping that will be also moved, be addressed. It's a very tight area. Yeah. Indeed. Any other questions or comments the building committee? The next committee is the Arts Committee. Carla? Mm -hmm. the arts Committee has actually met twice since the last board meeting. Um, we met on March 13th. Um, one of the things we're using um, to help us develop our mission vision statement is we have an excellent document from the Massachusetts Department of Education on arts curriculum, which has already done a lot of the work that we hope to do and it's it's quite a good document so we're kind of using it as a guide and a framework because a lot of it is very applicable and a lot of it looks like the kind of thing that will save us a lot of time by using their document 
we're also using the Goals 2000 and some of the things that were in the statewide learning results as a guide. Um, so we've been working very hard at defining the mission and vision. We also have had some discussions on developing a survey for the school community on the arts and what people expect and want out of arts education. Inventory of supplies in all three schools is ongoing. And at the March 13th meeting, there was some discussion of a small group. Um, they were going to get prepared for the March 30th workshop, what they were going to do for their presentation. And that was, I believe, Rebecca Wing and Richard Roethlisberger and Nancy St. John were going to work on that. And the next meeting we had was on March 18th because we had gotten a lot of momentum going on the statement and we kind of wanted to keep working on that and that's primarily what we did do at the March 18th meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for April 22nd at 3.30 in the Pond Cove Art Room. And at that meeting we're expecting to continue working on the statement and also discuss um, site visits. Great. Thank you, Carla. Any questions? Um, and the next committee is the Research Strand. Carla? Yep. Um, research Strand also met on March 13th. It ended up not really being, I don't want to say official meeting, we ended up not doing what was really on the agenda because only a very small group of people showed up. Quite a few people were missing. So we did briefly discuss the Jim Curry course, which was scheduled to start the very next day, March 14th. At that time, there were still many spaces left available. and. Um, I don't know if any more teachers have since signed up. We did have spaces available the day before, but there was room for more if they wanted to. And uh, that group also, again, discussed what they were going to do at the March 30th workshop. Uh, there was then a general discussion of use of the internet and use of email in school systems. And the next meeting of the research group is April 23rd at 3 p.m. in the council chamber meeting room right here. Thank you, Carla. Um, and before we move on, I just wanted to um, pass out to board members a um, proposal for the athletic study committee that I um, put together and Connie has looked at. Um, it is a committee that we discussed forming through the um, budget process and that hopefully will get going this spring and um, be working into the fall next year so we have the information to put together the budget for the following year. And any comments or um, feedback, you can call me or Connie on it. Um, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business. And the first item is the proposed fiscal year 96-97 budget. And Charlie. OK, you should have received in your packet a revised front section. Um, which essentially gets to the bottom line of a, um, an increase of $208,744 or an increase of 1.8% uh, because we are going to ask for um, a release of additional subsidy that we received this year. Uh, it will actually not impact at this point uh, the tax rate. Um, in our earlier school board subcommittee finance meeting, there were some issues um, that have been brought to our attention, uh, things that the board would like to look at. Um, I believe um, one of those is to look at the um, tech time that is now in the Pond Cove Media Center, we had um, in this budget proposed to reduce that from 45 hours to 30 hours. Um, it was the intent, I believe, of the person who made that recommendation to actually reduce it to 32.5. So we did add back the 2.5. Um, there was some discussion in our finance subcommittee, and I believe that a consensus was reached, which we will um, share now, and that was to 
actually increase the hours to 40, which is a reduction of five from what they totally have now. Uh, we did have the Pond Cove Media Center um, teacher there, uh, and Shari Robinson, and she shared as she had with some earlier um, data um, why she was justifying what she had. Is there anyone else on the board who would like to address that? No, I appreciate all the information gathering that went on that helped um, clarify that issue, and it's something we want to look at the three libraries system-wide in the future, and um, we will be working on it. That will still um, essentially leave the media center with a full-time person five days a week. There's one day they currently overlap on Wednesdays. One is there on three days, the other is there on three days, three days and then they overlap on one day. Um, with, with the reduction, they would not overlap. Anybody from the audience that would like to address that particular issue? Um, the second was a request from the high school math department to um, add back a request of 0.2 FTEs, and I believe the, um, the head of the math department is here, Mr. McCandless, would you like to address that? Um, hello. Uh, we uh, are working uh, with 28 sections this year, with uh, Elaine Brownell also teaching a half a year of the lighthouse uh, and Paul Jackson picking up that half of the math course um, helping us out from the science department. Uh, next year due to uh, increased enrollment we had some additional sections in algebra and in uh, pre-calculus uh, and some other shifting as the numbers changed um, and we consolidated and did the best we could to uh, keep sections down. Um, some things were combined um, which one was a tutorial. Um, and we feel that it's very important to offer computer programming as something that uh, we feel has been needed uh, for a long time uh, and hope that we are in a position to offer that uh, with, with a full 30 sections. And um, so uh, that was uh, some of the information that was in the letter that uh, I, I sent to you uh, just to make sure that um, we had the full information. Um, the computers needed for it would be in the computer lab that Betsy Nielsen teaches in. She teaches five classes, um, maybe six at the, at the most. There would be a period that, you know, owing to scheduling arrangements that we could use that equipment. Um, we have somebody qualified to teach the course. Uh, and we are working with the science department to cover the math course um, that would be open. So the changes from our perspective are minimal. Are there questions or anything I can help? And this is separate from the technology, the library aid, computer aid position, which is the second part of, of uh, my concern. And as I understand, there's going to be a, a, um, a computer coordinator in some respect that um, might be able to address these issues maybe down the road. But uh, it's a concern that um, we as classroom teachers have a hard time um, being able to bring a class to a computer lab and have that lab uh, be, be running and useful to us um, for our class um, without it being staffed. Uh, right now, the, the one that we have that's accessible to classroom teachers has uh, nine out of the 14 machines running. Uh, we have student volunteers helping us constantly to try and keep things running and get printers uh, hooked up and the mouse, uh, you know, configured properly, and uh, it uh, cannot be used as an open lab for students to come in and use um, during their free periods uh, without any staffing, and it is very difficult to uh, keep that even ready for classroom use uh, without any staffing. So that was the two parts of, of my concern. I think as far as the, the technology uh, aspect of it, um, the technology sub the technology committee has had actually in their five year plan for the third year was looking at um, a half time person for each building as a resource person. 
Um, I think in the discussions that ensued, we felt that if we, at this time, if we could actually bring on board a full-time um, technology coordinator, which actually was, I think, in the, like the fifth year of the plan, that we really needed someone to kind of focus. Right now, we're using um, our current staff who are full-time teachers with full-time loads, trying to to keep, you know, a growing you know, technology um, um, department or area uh, functioning and running. And I think we need to, before we start expanding staff, we need to have someone who can kind of focus everything and hopefully we'll have time to deal with some of these issues. And if not in our next budgetary, you know, it would be his responsibility to, to help bring that budget forward and might bring across the reorganization of how you know how we cover those labs. They will be growing. Yeah. Um, the fact that the that the high school will have almost three functional labs by the time we get through this, the, the you know the ensuing budgets purchases will release more computers to the science and math department in the high school. So that you're actually going to have more hardware to work with, which is good for the students and the staff but also adds additional burden of maintaining those. Um, so I think that is the direction of the board. There was a request also from the Pond Cove to have a part-time um, tech um, in their computer lab also to kind of coordinate and help with those kind of problems that you're, that you're stating. Um, I think in the budgetary discussions that we've had previously about the increases in FTEs brought by the high school principal. Um, we tried to, I think, approve what we felt would meet the needs of, of the increased enrollment and maintain the staffing that you have because you had some people coming back from leave, which would, leaves of absence, which would, or partial, uh, had cut down to partial years and were coming back full time, which would, if we did not increase those FTEs at this time, um, we possibly could have lost some, some very um, capable people that we really need once, the, once in the next, and actually in the, in the next two years, we're going to really need those people to fill the increase in enrollment. Um, one of the things that we said to the, to the principal when we cut some of those FTEs was they were kind of marked towards certain curriculum um, increases or new offerings in curriculum. And we really weren't saying we didn't approve those curriculum offerings. What we were saying was if there was some way for your, for your staff and your departments to decide to, to set priorities of what they wanted to offer, that was the message we were sending, you know, so that we weren't micromanaging and saying, no, you cannot offer that. Um, if there's some way that you can, I personally feel that if there's some way that you can even offer that as a half a semester course with the, with the staffing you have, then go ahead and do it. Um, anyone else? Yeah, we, we had a little discussion at the Finance Committee meeting about this and that we feel strongly about the increase just of 0.2 to the math department and um, not the full 0.4 that was originally requested. But within that 0.2 and your existing staffing, um, you can work out with Rick whatever, mm -hmm. whatever works. Is and, and I um, you know, took this opportunity to advocate um, for the math department a little bit because uh, I, I believe we've, we've lagged a little bit in the area of um, being able to offer computer programming. Uh, this is my first year as a department head, and uh, I took this opportunity, but I thank you for uh, uh, listening to what we have. Ann? I think this um, points to a real need um, that the board has to have all this information at the start of the process, too, in order, in all fairness to you. But I think it's very important that we have a, a lot of written information um, you know, not, not just from Rick, who has to present the entire budget, from, but from the people to whom it means the most. In this case, <coughs> um, it's you, in terms of, of what this means. So we have a true understanding of where you are. 
um, because to get a letter uh, like this when you haven't been involved in our budget process, we you know we haven't talked to you directly, um, and we haven't heard from you. It, it makes it difficult to sort out what the real issues are and where there may be um, lapses in communication. So I think um, you know, this is just one example of where we need to continue to look at ways to improve the budget process so there's ongoing communication and we have enough information because I, I, after I read your letter and really started thinking about it, I, I started thinking that it's, it, it appeared to you like we were trying to tell you exactly what you could or couldn't offer and that wasn't the point. You know, the point was just that you, you kind of had to live within the staffing that we thought we could afford. Um, so I think if we can continue to discuss ways to improve the communication, um, that'll help. Okay. And we also felt we had an obligation to those five students who have, who have outstripped our math curriculum. They may not have the number of credits they need, even though they've taken all our courses as far as their high school transcript don't have all the credits they need in math and we needed to address that this year. This, this is, should be a one-time situation with the changes that you're instituting in pre-cal. And, and that's what the, the preliminary discussions, that was what was asked of us and, and I, I felt that we uh, explained that but this came to me after the original round so it's just a, uh, you know, it's an ongoing process but uh, um, you know, I would still like to try and uh, you know make computer programming go if, if at all possible and I, I maybe can do it without the FTE, uh, you know, two tenths, but uh, I appreciate you uh, hearing our concerns. Great. We thank, thank you. you. Okay. You have the list. I know, I lost <laughs> it. Um, and I'm leading the meeting. I, I have a list. Yes. Okay, I put mine somewhere, and I'm not sure where it was. Okay. Well, I thought I. Uh, how are? How do you? There also was. Them? There also was a discussion the, um, for a point two position. increase in the social worker. Um, there was some misunderstanding in the budget process, probably precipitated by myself, <laughs> <laughs> by by challenging the uh, <laughs> the special ed director that he could have the position if he could find the money within his existing budget. And he did that, but we actually didn't take a consensus of the board. So there was a little bit of discussion on that. Um, if you would like to just kind of address how you plan to do that, and then we'll just take another consensus of the board. Charlie, it's noble of you to accept that blame, but I don't think it's entirely yours. Um, as you may remember the basis for the request for a continue, continued service, or actually an increase in service, is somewhat driven by um, a number of children who continue to come into the system with more significant needs. And in this uh, past year, one of those uh, factors which have uh, has increased uh, the need for PAM services has been a, a placement by the Department of Human Services in our school. And um, when that sort of occurrence uh, comes uh, down to us, uh, that increases uh, PAM's work not just with the child but also with the family and other state agencies and local service agencies. And what is happening over the next several months uh, is uh, we have uh, that need and uh, additional children entering school in kindergarten. The helpful news in part of this uh, is that uh, s some of our social work services are reimbursed to us now uh, by the State Department of Education under a statute known as the State Agency Client Bill. And so, in fact, in this case, um, what is happening is that we are, in fact, taking in more than we're expending. And uh, when we met on March 9th, we had just uh, received the first two payments of that and hadn't realized at that point the actual uh, amount that this would project to. And so in our discussion on that day, uh, thus my 
question to you is if we could, in fact, find the funds within what we have, would the board approve the request? And uh, so since that time, we've had even more income to offset this. And I think we're in a, a fortunate position, actually, to have the two things come together. One, the request driven by more need, and two, the income that we've not had in the past. So that's the basis for that, Charlie. Since this this would not impact <coughs> the budget, it impacts it in an increasing income. No, revenue. no, no. But it doesn't impact the tax rate or That's our right. existing budget line. Yeah. But it is an increase in FTEs. So therefore, on this particular issue, I would like to put it forth as a motion. Can I ask a question? Yes. A question? Yes. Uh, did I understand that? We were actually getting uh, more reimbursement than the cost of this um, increase. Point two. The point two. Actually, that's true, Gail, and it's uh, substantially more than I expected originally. So, will the additional funds that are incoming offset other special um, your your particular budget, or does it go into the general pot? Well, it's sent to us as a special special education reimbursement. Okay. And so it becomes part of your revenue intake how it's utilized, I think, is just part of the but it, it, revenue it, process. It's to stay within your department? It's not, not designated as such. It's simply revenue to the school system. OK. okay. Can, can we find out how much that is? And yes, you can. Uh, Scott can, I think, project that. And I haven't seen the actual uh, checks, but I know Scott's reviewed that. And, and he noted to me the other day uh, a projection that probably will end up somewhere between two and a half and three times the actual cost of this point two social work service. So, but this this money is following a particular child. So yes. we're my concern what is that we increase a position based on the revenue generated by <coughs> one child, um, and you know that's that's my basic concern. Yep. Um, you know, with this situation. Um, let alone the concern I raised before, which is now we have the health and guidance um, curriculum committee in place that is supposed to be looking at all, you know, this whole curriculum area and staffing and, um, you know, where that should be system-wide. And, um, you know, I, w I would have loved to have seen uh, that committee have a chance to, to look at the needs system-wide. Um, if we do increase uh, the social worker, I hope this doesn't become an ownership issue. If it turns out that we actually need, you know, some social work uh, services in the middle school or whatever, we can start sharing these resources. Um, I couldn't agree more. That's real important to me. And it's also important to me, like we're asking the math department and everyone in this school system uh, to do, to look really hard at you know, what we absolutely have to do and what's nice to do and to be able to prioritize. At one time, I, I think at our last budget workshop, I asked you, was there any place you could see that you could cut your budget? Um, because everyone else has been, you know, <laughs> bled like a stone. I know you have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, legalities that you have to cover, but it's very hard, I think, for the general public, anybody else to see, you know, one area where we have continuing increase for, um, you know, staffing and money, um, it, it all goes into this area. Nothing, nothing ever can, seems to come out. So I would just, again, plead with you. I hear you. If you can turn the rest of that money <coughs> over, you know, to meet, meet another need because your needs have all been met, mm. uh, that would be great. But I really think it's a challenge for this system that if we're going to keep adding staff, that we learn how to share that staff and, um, you know, move it around as, as needed. So I would hope we would do that with this position. And, and I would hope the committee um, reviews that fairly analytically. It's so. an important charge for that committee. Yeah. There is, a, as I mentioned to you at our last budget session, Anna, um, just the beginnings of um, um, revenue uh, from Medicaid as one system of, uh, or one vehicle for offsetting some of the rather unique costs driven by uh, special education. And uh, recently, um, 
Connie signed a, a letter to the commissioner that initiated uh, some uh, awareness training for all school systems in how to access uh, some new authorization under Medicaid. And I think in another budget year, I'm, I'm very hopeful that in fact the kinds of matters that you uh, raised, Beth, in our last session will be able to actually give you some figures around that as a new system because this is a changing arena in terms of funding uh, from Congress to the locals now. So. Are there other comments? I just wanted to say, Wayne, I, I didn't support this increase in staff for some of the reasons Anne gave. Um, also, because I feel that um, we need to let, well, as she said, let that committee do its work. And I also feel that um, once we do have an increase in staff, if that child does some reason go and the funds go, it's very hard to um, keep supporting that staff and that um, we really need to be using the money we receive from that child to offset the cost of special ed for that child and then more money back in the system for, mm. the, for the other children. Um, so just for what it is. Um, but there was the consensus of the board that we would go ahead with this. Mm. So, we should probably take a board of okay. vote action. Is there a motion? I move uh, an increase of 0.2 in the Ponco social worker with no impact on the budget. Is there a second, Gail? Any further discussion? Yeah, Gail? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Beth, could I? Yeah. No impact meaning expenditure, right, Charlie? That's right. <laughs> because no, no impact also has a revenue side, I'm not sure. Yeah. On, our on our final budget line. Yeah. Okay. That's the word I meant. Thanks. <laughs> All those in favor? All those opposed? 4-3. 4-3. Okay, the next one I believe was bleachers. Someone yeah. want to talk about the bleachers? I'll just say it's my continuing plea that we deal with the bleacher situation at um, the middle school. Um, unfortunately, it, it couldn't be dealt with uh, through the uh, building project. It was something that came up kind of late in the game, um, and our, our uh, available funds now certainly won't support it. Um, I think uh, if anybody spent any, any time watching uh, basketball games in there last winter when we had chairs lined up. Um, I don't think that's a real acceptable uh, solution. Um, I think it's very dangerous, actually. I mean, you're constantly seeing, you know, these quite large children careening into the, these rows of chairs where they're little kids and, you know, just all kinds of bad issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's just an unfinished piece of the project, and I think uh, we should try to find the estimated 12 to 13,000 that it'll probably take to repair one side of those bleachers. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, the cost of new bleachers for one side of the room was 35 or 40,000? 38,000. 30, 38, then there was an, a possible solution of plastic inserts that would go under the bleachers that would then make them safe, which is the repair solution, which is approximately 13 or 14,000? Could you go on to explain uh, how this came about that we can now discuss this repair to the bleachers when at one of the original meetings we were told that that was um, not an option for our budget? Um, it happened by chance. It happened on school business managers magazine. There was a new company that was And insurance-wise, we're, we're fine with a repaired bleacher? And yes, the real issue is the open bleacher versus the enclosed bleacher. That's the piece of it. And obviously, there's some boards that would have to be replaced, but they would also be covered in the vinyl insert. Have they looked at the, you know, the, the steel structure of that? Has anybody looked at the steel structure? Yes, we've had our insurance company has looked at the bleachers as well as the structure underneath. We also had Hussey Bleacher come down and take a look at it. Uh, it really was with the steel 
structure of the bleacher. It was the openness of the bleachers. Thank you. It was. <laughs> It was the openness of the bleachers um, that was really the problem and that's been cited by our insurance company for several years. And when we found that out, the bleachers were closed and left closed, which is why the that's right. chairs That's That's right. Um, one thing I would like to recommend to the board is that I'd like to see what our fund balance is at the end of this year. And there may be some repairs that we can do that out of this year's budget. And I'd like to leave that open to present that to the finance committee. Keith. Keith. Uh, Scott, I was wondering if you knew after the repairs if they'd still be able to open and close. Will they be open all the time? No, they'll still open and close. They'll still buy fault. So how how would you do that if to see what would be left at the end of our budget year? How do you propose this budget knowing that that's unclear? Well, one of the issues that happen is obviously if we don't um, expend all our supply or equipment or um, uh, certain lines within our budget, um, you know, it's been pretty historical that we turn back a small portion of our budget to the town each year. What I would suggest is encumbering those funds at June 30th um, when we look at what our fund balance is and carry that forward to the next year as an encumbrance. And Gail's question basically is, it would be paid out of this year. We'd have to uh, still do a lump sum tonight, yeah. accept a budget without knowing what the outcome of yeah. that is. Yeah, I would, um, um, I would anticipate um, right now and having conversations with Wayne Dorr about some of the uh, um, subsidy that's coming back to us um, through some of the special ed lines. I think we can probably handle that in this year's budget. Do you think we could safely not include ble bleachers in this upcoming budget um, and create the bleacher repair? Yeah, put me on the spot, Gail. I would say <laughs> yes, we can. Okay. At this point, I would say yes, we can, you know, with no hidden unforeseen problems at this point. I think uh, the way our budget's going right now, I think we'll have a strong enough fund balance to deal with that. Hmm. Just to remind the board that for every $7,000 that we add to this budget, it impacts the tax base by one cent. So. I'm not suggesting that no, no, no. we add it into our budget. I just don't want people to forget about it. And I basically you know, think it's important to have this discussion and understand it's a critical need we should try to fund. And we do. It, we have a, a solution in. which is much cheaper than right. when we went through the building process. So, yeah. if we put it in to the upcoming budget, but found that we could pay for it out of this budget, can we amend the upcoming budget? It just goes to the contingency. Well, at this, at this, yeah, we just go in the contingency. At this point, if you add it back, it, it if you add it to the, what we have for a bottom line, it does impact the tax base. So these are the things we have to bear in mind. Is this a vote again? Would you have to vote on this? Well, we're going to we vote on, a, on the budget. No, no, if it's I a meant particular the item of adding back in, we probably should have a, vote, uh, a uh, motion vote. Carla, did you have a question? Yeah, I would just say that my inclination, if we are going to vote, is I would not want to fund this this year. And we've had the kind of conversations that we've had and a little bit tonight where we've talked about um, some academic issues. This is a fairly large sum of money for a non-academic item. And my inclination would be not to put it in the budget. For next year. Right. Yep. And, if, <clears throat> and if we could find, if we could encumber, you know, funds for fine. this year, that would, that would meet with your. Right. Okay. Keith? I was just wondering if we had a plan for the other side. Yeah, our plan was that we really didn't need didn't. the other side so that, anymore. That's coming out. Yeah, that we could really survive with just one side. It's not used as a meeting space like it used to yeah, be. Yeah, it used to, you know, the um, stage used to be there. Right. So it was, you know, for the full space. So. Yeah, so there is no plan to do the other side. So we now we have another area where we can congregate for the, the needs that a double sided uh, leisure system required. Plus, we also have a, another gym which has alleviated some of the. Do, do we have a basic agreement, though, that if we have money left over in this he year's could, budget, we can put it towards that? The business that? manager would bring it to the finance subcommittee. Yeah. I think we would have to move on it at that time. Right. What the issue right now is, do we add it to next year's budget? Right. Yeah. Uh, do, would okay. you like a motion? No. Yes, uh, OK. okay. Uh, I move that we do not include the repair of the bleachers in this upcoming budget. Is there a second? I second it. Charlie. Further discussion? All so those in favor. I just want to clarify. Yes, so the motion is not, is not, not to accept. Yes, <laughs> not. Okay. Yeah. 
All those in favor of not adding. I, I just wanted to say <laughs> I, I would be in favor of doing it with any reserve funds this yes. year, and I think we need to address it in the future, but not to add it in the budget. So, any other discussion? All those in favor of not, of adding. not adding. <laughs> Seven zero. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Our secretary to the uh, budget process, is there any more on your list? <laughs> uh, yes, there was I, one. My notes are not real. <laughs> We're not really meant for this purpose. Um, the salary um, adjustment. Yeah, the super, superintendent line. Um, since we are uh, in the process of looking for a new superintendent, um, it's pretty clear that we don't have quite enough um, in our budget right now to cover what we anticipate um, we'll need for uh, to, to hire a new superintendent. Um, so we need to uh, <laughs> address that somehow. Well, realistically, I, we need to add another 10,000 to that line? Well, I think just as a round figure. I think, not to put Scott on the spot, but I think we need to know. Where's the bottom line? Where we are, ri <laughs> where we are right now between uh, the change in the support teams, the change in, you know, all those changes were just... Adding the library ed techs back, the right. changes we've made. And the athletic uh, <coughs> stipend, is that an issue that he can add back? What I should make, make the, board, the whole board aware and the community is that we had approved girls lacrosse for next year. In approving it, we essentially ask the athletic director, the principal and the athletic director, to go back and find the cost of that program in their existing budget. Today, the athletic fee committee met, and the, the athletic director came back with some revisions, some of it um, kind of mandated by the, the main principals association due to, to a shortening of some of the, of the seasons of some of our sports, and we were able to realize the 5,000 that we we asked to be cut from that athletic budget, plus he also realized 27,000 more. 2,700 more than we asked him, so that <laughs> he actually gave us back 2,700 from his budget. You were dreaming, Charlie. Huh? You were oh, dreaming. dreaming. <laughs> Too many meanings. So Scott, do you have a... A little over a one cent increase on the tax rate. How about the money um, Wayne was talking about that we would receive for that individual child that would be in excess of that point two we were adding? Do we have a sense of what that would be? I don't have an exact figure on that right now. I'd have to go back up to the office and calculate it. Um, we had some preliminary discussions about it, and I'm just not prepared right Do now. Do we feel to that, that we could take 8000 out of Wayne's special ed budget to get close, Wayne? If he was looking at 2.5 to three times the cost in reimbursement, it appears. Is that, what's the point? Yeah, to? basically the increase in cost was $7,700. So if you took twice that, um, yeah, we'd come pretty close. So I think we could if we reduce the special ed budget to get a zero tax increase. Wayne, I don't want to put you too much on the spot. But, yeah. Uh, how we, how we handle that right now is we actually credit the special ed salary line um, for the additional subsidy that's returned to us. So yes, in fact, we can reduce the special ed budget by that additional revenue. Okay. I would, I would and maintain that zero that. tax impact. Yeah, I would feel comfortable with that if. So, so then we are really not increasing this dollar, the bottom dollar. That's what we're, we're just trying to sort out. Reallocating all the funds. Out. Any other discussion? Any other issues? Well, could I bring up one item? The yep. gates for the middle school. If we have extra money in this year's line, 
after we buy the new ble the repair on the bleachers, would that be reconsidered again? I think oh. they're also looking at some other alternative. Oh, they are. Alternative um, security. Uh, Nancy security. Could address that your your gates that you offered up. <laughs> Actually, it's my friend Phil who has those gates um, in his dreams. And the gates were really more for our events that we have within the building, usually the dances, quite frankly. The other systems that we're talking about have to do with security for the building and entrance into the building. So the gates are more of an internal control once we have a dance or if we ever had a social there. Usually our socials are at the high school. Um, the other system is for external entry. So okay. I think they're two slightly different things. I don't know, Phil, did you want to add anything about those gates? <laughs> are we, are, is that security system being included in this year's budget? It's currently under study right now for soon. For soon. Oh, for soon. I think it was something soon. that we needed to address this year that we could not really wait till next okay. year. Okay. Okay. Yes. I think that, um, I mean, we could go back through the whole budget and decide little pieces we wanted to put back in, but That's I think my that only issue. I think that would be folly, <laughs> because um, I, I'm still kind of overall concerned that our contingency is pretty low, um, and we always have unanticipated needs, and um, we even have a, a kind of a, a run on the uh, a possible run on the contingency for next year already, um, that Connie alerted us to. So. Um, I think rather than, you know, think about things we can add back in, it's very, you know, it's I wasn't a few adding it dollars. into this year. I was seeing whether it would be no, covered no. under what was left over, but we just add that all into a contingency. Are we allowed to keep that to put into a contingency? No. I didn't think so. No. But you Scott always addresses okay. that at the yeah, end. Yeah, but year. we need to know what the we don't yeah. have that bottom line yet. What what I'd like to do is uh, for the June Finance Committee meeting, I'd like to bring you a list of priorities, okay, to the Finance Committee and let you decide what you'd like to expend any fund balance that we have on. Okay. okay. Good. Charlie. What we have come to is a very, very tight budget. The business manager, the superintendent, uh, the board, the administrators have all gone back and really looked at this. Uh, the business manager has looked at it line by line, so there, there is no play unless there are supply lines or something that for some reason, you know, staffing doesn't use them. But I mean, as far as benefits and all those other lines, they're extremely tight. It's only going to take, you know, one change in any of those lines, especially the benefit lines, to, to throw us into our contingency fund. So. Anyone else have any other issues they would like to add, subtract, delete? I'd just like to make a comment that I feel good about this budget. The budget we, we uh, started with was quite a bit higher than that, I think, um, than, than what we have here. I feel this is a very responsible budget. Yes, it's tight. But I think that's the reality we're going to be operating on under all of us um, for the foreseeable future um, so I think we're going to need to um, you know really stay on top of things and really keep up with our curriculum work really uh, work together to prioritize and making sure we're doing things as efficiently as we can and not doing things that we can't do well with the resources that we have so um, I feel comfortable with this budget I don't have any more comments anyone else We need a motion? Make a motion? Yeah. I would propose a budget of $11,801,377, which is an increase of $208,744 over our current budget, or an increase of 1.8%. In that would be a request of the town council for, Scott, I need that figure. <laughs> no, it's here at 150. Yeah. What we would request from the uh, whole carry for. Yep. No, no, no. In that figure, it would be a request from the town council to release $150,336 of a, of a carry forward 
or additional subsidy that we received this year. Is there a second? Anne. Further discussion? I would like to, which would, which would result in no increase to the tax base. I still second it. You still second it. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? I just want to thank everybody for their hard work. Mm. It is a hard place to get to, but we did it. And um, I think the all-day budget meeting was um, pretty effective, and it was the only way we were going to get through the month of March. <laughs> Um, all those in favor? I would like to make one more comment. Oh, good, sir. I want, I want to thank Beth for the March 14th meeting. Because <laughs> she, uh, she was my uh, flip chart person, and she really kept us moving. So. Yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you. All those in favor? 7-0. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, the next item on the agenda is policy, second reading. And um, we've got them. Okay. Um, we just have one policy for second reading, file IGBAC, referral to the pupil evaluation team, um, and its companion notice of authorization, file IGBAC-E3. Um, as we talked about last month, these were uh, suggested changes um, from the special ed site review committee, I'm not sure the exact name, uh, but these were requested, we were requested to make these changes. So if anybody has any questions, Wayne's here tonight, so. Are there any questions? Is there a motion? I move that we accept these policies. Is there a second? As previously As stated. Second, Priscilla. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Next item on the agenda is new business. And the first one is the consideration of the proposal from the United Sports Fan Association. And we had some information in our packet. And mm -hmm. Connie, did you want to speak <coughs> further? <or? coughs> uh, we need the shirt. Rick, there's a shirt upstairs on my, my table, if you wouldn't mind. I'm sorry, I forgot to bring it down. Thank you. I said I would not wear it, <laughs> that I would bring it, but I wouldn't wear it. Okay. Uh, we have a gentleman here tonight, Brendan Hickey, um, one of our coaches actually, but uh, he has given us some information. You've, we've raised this sort of informally uh, a couple times during the budget process. You asked for some specific information. You did come in and meet with me, uh, gave you some answers to uh, the questions. Part of what you have in your packet is some material that was presented um, by the uh, athletic director at GORM, so there's a lot of referencing to GORM in here, but that uh, some of the uh, issues that they were asking about are similar to some of your questions, so we simply took that. Um, I might ask Brendan if he would mind coming down and talking, but I'll start the discussion. This is a, an attempt to organize the fans of America, as I understand it. You can correct that a little bit if you want to. Um, but part of this is, uh, frankly, a for-profit for corporation that has uh, several purposes, among others, trying to give fans a voice in some of the national disputes about what kind of things people really want. Thank you very much. And. Um, but part of it is an attempt to support sports uh, through schoolboy sports. And we had some discussion about getting sponsorship so that uh, there would be various logos. And I think when we first started talking about this, they were much larger. I'll pass this around. You will notice that the USFA uh, letters are on, and in, frankly, letters too small to, for me to read anyway without my glasses. There is uh, small print, which I gather is what the local uh, business sponsorship would be. So why don't I pass this around and Brendan ask you to add to that very brief explanation of what this is all about. It would be soliciting some business sponsorship for individual logos that would be carried on um, individual teams. Right. One thing that uh, people should realize is the USFA is trying to be or is going to be a buffer between corporations and the schools. 
One thing that we don't want to have happen uh, throughout this process, for example, if we end up getting Nike as a, as a corporate sponsor for funding school athletic uh, uniforms or equipment or whatever um, the athletic directors put down on their uh, need list. But what we're doing is we're trying to act as a buffer um, so that Nike can't come in and say, now that we've sponsored you guys, now you guys have to wear all of our cleats or we're not going to sponsor you anymore. We have, co we have uh, contracts that are being signed by corporations that are basically saying that there's no contact with the schools whatsoever. No solicitation, nothing. All we're looking for is support for public schools and we're looking for them to fund it through the USFA and the USFA will put the... Um, put our emblem on the uniforms and if the corporations want to advertise in the red box underneath that's where they will advertise one thing that you'll come across is uh, right come here, you're saying that it would say the sponsor that's right. right what it says in there right now is United Sports Fans Association in that red in box that little, in that little that's red. correct now one thing that you're going to come across is is companies such as coca-cola and we have a company such as Coca-Cola who might want to sponsor USFA, but they want to do all the schools and none of the schools because they're afraid that if they only do a couple of the schools, that they, all these other schools will come after them and saying, why didn't you sponsor us? So what um, a company such as Coca-Cola would do is they would fund USFA and be a support of USFA, and what would end up being on the uniform would just be USFA, United Sports Fan Association, and that's it. What we end up doing is we send out uh, brochures, um, hats, decals, um, shirts to all its members, and th those memberships are, are what basically drive um, the company itself. What we've tried to do is try to get USFA a good reputation in the communities by supporting public school systems. The USFA will not come in and solicit any business either into the school systems. We're not going to be coming into the school system saying, we want all these kids to be members. I certainly didn't want, want anything to do with that, and that was one of the initial um, responses when we first started this out, but at this point in the game, um, we, have, we have now um, said no go, and that we'll, we will just leave the school systems alone. What we're going to use them for, basically, is to, to get corporations to divert their advertising dollars into the school system to fund um, athletic programs. Uh, there's really two, two sides of it. That's one side. The other side is how can we end up raising money for the USFA. The USFA raises money through its memberships. And what ends up happening, for example, is we have Bath Ironworks and its union, Local 6, right now, that what they're trying to do is they're trying to, um, Local 6, for example, is trying to become a, um, to try to do some public service in their community. And what they've decided to do is to take us up on our program. What we're doing actually is going up there, offering them three memberships apiece. They end up buying three memberships apiece in the union, which is about 5,000 members. And then in turn, there's about um, $200,000 that go into their general fund. We basically help them raise money um, to put back into, into the communities. So if we help them raise $200,000, we're giving them incentive to throw it back into the school systems. We're giving them an idea of how they can bring it back into the school systems um, and, and get a positive response out of it. Um, and that's something that they certainly want to do. Uh, and we're in the, also in the process right now of working with the management side of General Dynamics and Bath Iron Works themselves. Um, and we're meeting with them on Friday, as a matter of fact, to finalize our decision with them. So basically what we have um, gotten to at this point is now we've gotten a union involved which drives memberships, which really has nothing to do with the school systems, other than the fact that this company will now, this union now has enough money to fund five or six school programs. Um, Bath Iron Works itself is now a corporation now that we will have, and that's, that's another 3,500 members of that corporation which we're looking to now get two, two, um, two means now, a corporation and a union. Basically why we want those is because we're planning on taking this countrywide. This is a, um, this is a program which uh, Senator Cohen has been advised about, which we're also meeting with Senator Cohen. Uh, Sports Illustrated of all places has asked to do an article on us in, in their program. And there are some companies on the New York Stock Exchange that have already um, looked at us at, at possibly purchasing us after a year or two of uh, a track record. So I think um, with the people behind us, uh, the people that are involved in, the, uh, in this company also might, might give a little realism to the company. Myself, um, 
Bowden graduate, uh, coach of the Cape Elizabeth High School hockey team. Um, I set up the, uh, a bank or a mortgage company for Chemical Bank uh, in the state of Maine, which is now Chase Manhattan. Uh, we are also uh, one of the other partners in this company is uh, John Gleason, who is the owner of Coastal Athletics, who basically does most of the um, most of the uniforms for most of the schools in, in this area. So you're dealing with some uh, pretty um, real people and some people that have some type of reputation. Um, I know it's a new venture, but um, I think um, we're very much on the verge of, of turning this thing over. The original patches on these things were so big, it was incredible. Then we started out with like the Coca-Cola inscription in a shirt, and at this point in the game, we finally narrowed it down to just a simple USFA. And whether that's on the back of the jersey or right here on the jersey, if you continue to look at that jersey, you can see on the inside it has a Wilson, um, a Wilson uh, tag on there. Once, once the players are out there on the field, no one's even going to notice, the, uh, really going to notice it that much. Uh, we try to make it as inintrusive as we possibly could. Um, I think the main questions that we came across on the Gore, at Gorham School Board was um, the corporations being able to get into the school. No, it won't happen. Um, the athletic director and the um, the athletic director will be able to choose all of the equipment that uh, they want. They have first right of refusal on everything. Um, Connie, I don't know if you want to go in any, to any further as far I, as. I think that if there are questions, actually what you have in your packet is a sample of um, uh, how we get the process started. The second step would be to uh, have a more formal contract uh, document. And I don't have the. I, the sample that you gave me this afternoon to our, our um, athletic fee committee and pass that around but I don't happen to have it here tonight uh, where you had added a little more language and uh, what what um, we're really asking the board to do tonight is to say you would allow us to go forward with this but there's one more step we do need to ask our attorneys to look at any contract we sign uh, which I understand other school districts uh, involved in this are doing it so it doesn't seem to me to be a a big risk issue. There are some issues, you know. Any any new venture, we don't always know what it is. Uh, we've just you've just passed a very tight budget. Budgets are going to get tighter. Uh, if there is a legitimate way that we can um, help with the expenses of some of the sports, it seems to me it's worth exploring, which is really what you're asking us to do. Correct. And do you have? We've been asking for a long time. Do you have any written information about your organization? I mean, you're, you're talking about we wouldn't have any contact with the sponsor, um, but we don't really know much about you. I mean, the fact that you coach here and that somebody who owns Coastal Athletics has something to do with it, but we don't even have a statement of the philosophy of the organization, when it started, where it's going, and, it, um, you know, it was, have uh, any written information? Well, what we did is we, we had the Better Business Bureau do a, um, they, they printed out a, um, what is it called, a, prospectus on who the USFA was and is. Basically, USFA has begun, it was, it's only begun, been begun for about uh, eight months to a year at this point. But you don't have a packet of materials that you no. give people? I have a real problem with making a decision to sign up, you know, for, uh, with any company um, that doesn't have a basic package of things that says who they are. If somebody came, came to me on the basis of what we have here and what you said and said, you know, who's US? FA, right. I, I don't know what I would tell them, and I don't know what kind of activities you're, you're into as far as working with sports teams across, um, you know, the country or, right. or what you're, you know. Well, one, one thing that we do have is we have a membership card which we actually put out in all the hockey rinks, all the um, basketball courts and, and so on and so forth. So basically on, on these brochures, they tell people what the USFA is. USFA actually is a membership-based company, and it says that right. In, it should say that right in your material. It's a membership-based company that what they're looking to do is to get people a voice and a vote in professional sports. What does that mean to the school systems? Probably nothing. But, but what they want to know is what USFA does. And what we do is basically try to develop a membership-based company where we end up getting people that have concerns over certain topics uh, throughout the community. They call in on a 1-800 number. We publish it in a newsletter that goes out four times a year. They vote on it and we get it back in. It's, it's, 
I guess I'd like to even see that because basically what you're saying is you're kind of a lobbying organization like um, the National Rifle Association or whatever, um, you know, working on sports issues. But, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable as a school board member, you know, signing up with to, you know, help out a lobbying organization without knowing more about you. Plus, I just think we need to, um, I think we're kind of going about this uh, backwards. I think we, we need a policy on sponsorship and, and things like that in this community first and deal with you within a guideline. But right now, even if we had a guideline, um, I, don't feel, I don't feel personally like we have enough information to go ahead. I, I personally don't want to see us uh, go ahead with this um, level of information to spend the money to have our attorney look at a contract. One thing that's happening as um, should be happening anyways is um, Gorham has already taken this to the next level after putting it through their board and they're in the process of showing it to their attorney. The final contract was not, has not been given to them. They asked for another clause to be put into it. By the time I got back to my office today with that clause in there, of course everyone had already gone home, but um, they're at the stages where their attorney is in the process of looking at it, which is the same attorney as Cape Elizabeth. So as far as having an attorney review the, stu uh, the information, it, sh it should all be there. Um, as far as um, the USFA and getting more information on the USFA, I, I could certainly get you the, uh, the first, um, first program that was sent out to all of its members at this point in the game. Um, I don't know what else I could do to, um, to satisfy that. I've tried to get uh, Connie as much information as I possibly could. On, on the USFA since it's such a new company. And, and that's, I think, where I stand at that. Can, can I just ask Rick one question? Rick. Is the... <coughs> Rick. 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 <laughs> Rick. Are, these, are, are these baseball uniforms in the... You know, they've, they've been paid for already, I assume, or whatever. These are uniforms we were going to use this year, right? They are new for next year. And did you have any more questions no. before Keith? Keith? Uh, I agree with Ann that I think it needs to be at the policy level before we can make this kind of decision. Um, and also, it should be definitely dealt with, I think, with the Athletic Study Committee at, at some point after the Policy Committee. Uh, also, I have a problem with you working at Cape Elizabeth and representing this company. Okay, I, I, that's, a, I think, a direct uh, conflict of interest. I, 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 I don't know if you work for Gorham and do coaching there as well or not, but I, 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 it seems somehow that you need to disqualify yourself from the process just because you, you can't work in the district. In my view, you can't work in the district and also stand to profit from that district. Well, one, one thing that you should note is that I'm working with the high school hockey team, which is run ma almost mainly on booster program support and kids funding their own equipment. And at this point in the game, the stuff that we have on our budget for Cape Elizabeth has nothing to do with hockey. Well, we spend about $19,000 a year on our hockey team. So well, what, what I'm basically getting to is the U what USFA is doing for Cape Elizabeth has nothing to do with the hockey program at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. I still believe it's a conflict of interest that you are employed here and you're also... Well, I, I have a question, and not for you, but for somebody who knows policy. Don't we already have um, scoreboards or things that have logos of different companies on them, and, and how did they get put in place? Well, we do, and I don't know, because they've been here ever since I have. Um, Time ago. Rick? I think, yeah, the, the, we're the Pepsi-Cola capers if you walk into our gymnasium. Um, and those with donations, I think what, what Brendan alluded to earlier, a lot of schools uh, have, have gone to pl places like Coca-Cola and Pepsi who have supplied those schools, um, you know, having their, their businesses go into the, uh, the various schools for business. And, and I think uh, as, as a, a gesture of, of uh, good faith, they have uh, given these scoreboards to a number of schools throughout uh, grade. I don't think I've been in a gym, uh, maybe one or two, that do not have some sort of 
uh, logo, either from, from Pepsi Cola or, uh, or Coca Cola, but they've been going on for, for a long, long time. So I don't know how, it's a great question. I don't know how they is, began getting into school systems, but they're, they're there. That way predates all of us. So. Mm -hmm. workshop we had in the fall you know people people think we should be looking for sponsorships and that kind of thing you know to help with the programming I'm not against doing that I just think that we should do it in a very clear um, cohesive way and if we do if we do it uh, you know in in this case where I just think we're doing it backwards we need the guidelines and then but but if we see. give it to our attorney and I know the